we need to be familiar with a term called the specific heat capacity of water. So the temperature of a substance, as we said before, is a kind of measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles. If particles have a high amount of kinetic energy, where every single particle is able to move and whiz around a lot, then it's said to have a high kinetic energy, and therefore a high temperature. Whereas if these all had low energy, and were moving around a lot less, then the temperature would be lower, and therefore kinetic energy and temperature are kind of interrelated. When a substance is heated, the energy from the heat is transferred to kinetic energy in the particles, resulting in a rise in temperature. So as we said before, we've got low temperature here, and particles have a low kinetic energy. So this means that there isn't much energy to go from the outside as heat into their kinetic energy, and so they're not really moving very much at all. If we increase the temperature, the heat energy can go into the particles and increase their kinetic energy. And this means that all of the particles can be more independent and move around faster. When water is a liquid, we have water molecules moving past each other, but still kind of attached by these hydrogen bonds between the molecules. The hydrogen bonds get continuously made and broken. So imagine a whole mess of water molecules in a sort of container or something, and all of the hydrogen bonds connecting them. If the hydrogen bonds never broke, then they would be fixed in a particular position. But in liquid water, we know that water is a flowing substance and it needs to move. So what's happening is, as one hydrogen bond breaks, another one forms, and as this one breaks, another one might form. So they're continuously being made and broken as the water molecules sort of flow around each other. And it's this flowing nature of the molecules which gives water its flowing nature overall. And if we wanted to increase the temperature of water, to increase its kinetic energy, some of the heat energy must be used to break the hydrogen bonds in order for the water molecules to move. So remember we've got water molecules held by hydrogen bonds, and because they're intermolecular forces, they require energy to be put in to break. And so for this we need to add heat energy to break this, and in doing so separating the molecules out into their environment and therefore making it more of a gas than a liquid. Because hydrogen bonds are very strong, we need more heat energy needed to increase the kinetic energy and therefore the temperature of water is higher to boil than for other liquids of the same size. So liquid oxygen, for example, has very little energy between each of the molecules, and so it doesn't take much to boil it. But for water, because there are hydrogen bonds, the energy needed as heat is a lot higher in demand. So to boil water, it's going to take a lot more heat. And because of this property, we describe water as having a high specific heat capacity. So what is high specific heat capacity? So specific heat capacity is defined as the amount of heat energy that's needed to raise the temperature of one gram of something by one degrees Celsius. So we're heating up one gram of something by one degree and how much energy that takes is describing a substance's specific heat capacity. So for water, this value is 4.2 joules. So joules is a measurement of energy and it stands for joules. So what it's saying is that if we have one gram of water in a beaker, to raise the temperature by one degree Celsius, so from one to the next one, we would have to give the heat energy of 4.2 joules. That's what the specific heat capacity is saying. So water, because of its hydrogen bonds, has a high specific heat capacity compared to other molecules of the same size. Something like oxygen is already a gas at room temperature, so the energy required to heat one gram of oxygen liquid is very low. And so at room temperature, it's already had all of that energy to boil it into a gas, but water hasn't. So because of this property, water doesn't heat up or cool down very easily, even when the air temperature varies so much. If the air temperature, for example, outside in the winter was 0 degrees Celsius, the water temperature could be around 4 degrees. It doesn't quite cool down as much as the air, or very quickly. In the summer, or in the daytime, if the air temperature rose to about 30 degrees, the water temperature would rise, but it wouldn't rise by a massive amount. It would only go up to about 14 degrees Celsius. So the range of heat for water doesn't change as much as that for air. So even if the air change goes between 0 and 30, the water's only increased by about 10 degrees, because it takes so much of this energy to actually heat up the water, and so it's really resistant to heating up. So this means that liquid water can exist in many different temperatures. And this property of water with a high specific heat capacity is essential for life. It means that lakes, seas and bodies of water stay at a stable temperature for the organisms that live within them. 
So even if the weather is very, very cold, or if the temperature is very, very hot, the water temperature stays quite stable. As well as this, obviously water makes up a massive part of our cells, for example in the cytoplasm. So because it's not changing its liquid environment, it can provide a stable environment for our enzymes and reactions to function normally. As well as talking about specific heat capacity, we need to be familiar with the term of latent heat of vaporization. So for water to change from its state of a liquid to a gas, we have to break hydrogen bonds between the water molecules. So we've said that before, if we had a liquid area of water, and we wanted to turn this into the gas form, they must be detached from each other. And so we have to break these hydrogen bonds. And in the gas form, the hydrogen bonds barely exist. And because already, as we've mentioned, the hydrogen bonds are much stronger than most other types of intermolecular forces, a relatively high amount of energy must be used to break them. So again, the energy used to pull these water molecules apart is provided with heat energy. And the amount to do this is much more in relative to other types of molecule. So we describe this as meaning that water has a high latent heat of vaporization. So vaporization means two things. It means turning a liquid into a gas, but this can be done in two methods. First of all, we can do it by evaporation, or we can do it by boiling, but they both come under the heading of vaporization because it's becoming a vapor. So latent heat of vaporization is the amount of energy needed to vaporize one gram of a substance. So essentially what it's saying is if we turned one gram of liquid water into vapor, the energy to do this is that latent heat of vaporization. So this is different to specific heat capacity, which talked about just raising the temperature of the water by one degrees. Here we're talking about the energy to break these hydrogen bonds and turn one gram of liquid into vapor. When the water does evaporate and those hydrogen bonds are broken, the water molecules that are able to break their hydrogen bonds have the highest kinetic energy. Because that heat energy has been input, the energy will be used to break certain bonds that did exist as that energy is transferred to the bonds, and then those water molecules are free to become a gas. So the ones that can do this obviously have the highest kinetic energy. The ones which are staying put and being bonded to other molecules in a liquid form have lower amounts of kinetic energy. So when the ones with the highest energy become a gas and they've escaped, there's a decrease in the average kinetic energy of the remaining water molecules. So imagine that now we've got several molecules being released because several hydrogen bonds have been broken. The average energy in the whole area has now gone down because a lot of that energy has been lost and taken into the water molecules which are now a gas form. So because the kinetic energy has gone down, and because kinetic energy means temperature, the temperature of the water has now decreased. So evaporation as a process has a cooling effect, whereby as those certain water molecules evaporate, the rest of everything left behind has reduced its temperature. So because of this, it's a great physiological mechanism for sweating. Humans use the evaporation of sweat from our skin as an effective way of reducing our body temperature. So if the temperature around us rises, we need to be aware of this because if it goes too high, our proteins can denature. So the first thing we do is we start sweating. And as we sweat, the water molecules closest to the surface vaporize, taking that heat energy in to break hydrogen bonds. And in doing so, they take that energy away from them. And then the water left behind is cooler and therefore we are cooler as well. This is also useful in plants because they can be cooled as the water evaporates from the mesophyll cells in the leaves and it diffuses through the stomata into the air. So this is a process called transpiration and if the water is leaving the leaves from the mesophyll area, it's taking that energy with it as those bonds get broken and therefore the temperature of the plant can decrease. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.